Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. It's good to see the visitors. We have visitors with us this morning. It's always good to have visitors. We welcome you here at Carmen. Our numbers are small, but we're loud. So if you would fill out a card, it's on the pew in front of you. And uh, we'll have a record of your visit. And come and see us again anytime you can. I'd like to welcome those that are worshiping with us at home. And hopefully someday soon we'll all be back together again. Um, pick up a bulletin if you haven't already got one. And in there you have a prayer list and uh, those undergoing treatments and uh, plus some good articles there also. Uh, also a lesson outline is available in the foyer. The sick list is short, which is always good. Debbie Fuller starts her chemo and radiation treatments this coming Wednesday. So our prayers go out to that family. It's going to be a, a six weeks of a, a real trial. So our prayers go out to that, them. Uh, Pat's here, says so she's doing good. That's good to hear. Any other sick that we need to put on our sick list or prayer list? Well, that's good enough. The Northern Announcement's always good to have David Willis. Here you are. So we'll enter into worship the song. Oh, 
prayers of those who care. I need the help of every Christian to take God's message everywhere. He answers prayer for all the faithful. He holds the future. Yes, they'll know we are Christians. 
Christians by our
Our God and Father, for the blood that was shed on the cross of Christ, that blood that washes away sins, we give you thanks for your willingness to send your only begotten Son. We give you thanks for His willingness to allow your will and not His own to be done. And we give you thanks for the cleansing, for the washing that flows from the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. now give thanks for our blessings. Our God and our Father, we are thankful for this beautiful day here in Middle Tennessee. We are thankful for this first day of the week in which we can come together and worship you and encourage one another with the songs that we sing. We give you thanks for our health. We give you thanks that we are living in a country that is not war-torn. We give you thanks for food to eat and clothes to wear and homes to live in. Father, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so forgive us when we fail to acknowledge that truth as often as we should. Forgive us when we fail to acknowledge those blessings that we take for granted. And while we give you thanks for these blessings that we have mentioned and countless others that we have not, we give you thanks for them and ask that you would help us to with each passing day, become more and more grateful and more and more aware of those things that you so generously give to us. And as we give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, help us to always have a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Every word, so let them bless. 
then I celebrate you this morning. Uh, that is not the mom that I had, and mom will be watching this later today. I will be getting a phone call for what I am about to say. I had a shoebox card type of, of mom. Uh, I got a lot of mixed messages growing up. Uh, for example, uh, I can remember my mom telling me that if I fall out of the tree and kill myself, don't come crying to her. Uh, I have been told to shut my mouth and eat. I don't know how to do that. Um, I learned things from my mom about thinking ahead. And so I've been told to put on some clean underwear in case you're involved in an automobile accident. Because yes, if I have a dismembered limb, that's going to be the most important thing that the RNs in the ER are going to be dealing with. By the way, Sarah Cook is now officially an RN, having graduated on, on Friday from Tennessee Tech. I learned about irony from my mom. This one may have come more from my dad, but, but I learned about irony. Stop that crying or I will give you something to cry about. Can't we just pass the middleman up there? I, I learned about the importance of uh, stretching. Would you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? I learned about hypocrisy from my mom. If I have told you once, I have told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. My father took me to my first Star Trek movie, but I truly learned to love science fiction and time travel from my mom. If you don't straighten up, I am going to knock you into the middle of next week. I learned about religion from my mom. You better pray the stain comes out of that carpet. <laughs> and I learned humility from my mom because there are millions of children in this world who do not have a loving mom like I do. And I am humbled to have the mom that I do. You know, God pays a beautiful tribute to moms in Isaiah as he refers to his love for his children as a mother's love. For this is what the Lord says. Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed. On her sides you shall be carried and be dangled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. This morning, three aspects of our Father God's mother heart, and the lesson will then be yours. The first thing that I see is that the love of a Christian mother typifies the love of God for His children. In Romans 5, verse 8, the Word of God tells us, But God demonstrates His own love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2, 3, To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I don't know if you know about this, but God's love is non-preferential. I remember hearing the story of a mother who had 12 children, and she was asked, which one of the 12 do you love the best? And the mother's response was, the one who is sick until he gets well, and the one who is away until she gets back home. 
uh, the, the idea is not one of degrees of love, but rather degrees of, of need here. And, and the same can be true of God. His love is non-preferential. In Romans 2 verse 12, we are told that there is no partiality with God. In Galatians 3, Paul tells us that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. And so we see in, in God's love, uh, that love that is mirrored for us in a mother, as we see that the love of a Christian mother typifies the love of God for His children. The second thing that we see is that the concern of a Christian mother typifies God's concern for His children. In Luke 13, Jesus is looking at Jerusalem. He is looking at the people of Jerusalem. Now yes, there are some Romans in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem by and large is a Jewish city. And Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as hens gather her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. It has been said that a father becomes concerned when his child breaks a bone and a mother when her child skins a knee. I can remember back to my mother working as many as three jobs, getting home at 10 p.m. or later, exhausted, but would find time to sit on the screen porch and uh, talk to me about my problems, which in the grand scheme of life were extremely insignificant and trivial in comparison to what she was dealing with. And to this day, I don't know how she was able to find the time. One of the things that we need to understand in life is that regardless of our view of somebody else's problems, they are very, very real problems to that individual. It's why when we are children, it seems that it takes forever for our birthday or Christmas to get here. If you are four years old, then a year is 25% of your life. <laughs> When you are 40, it's 2.5% of your life, right? That's why life seems to speed up the older we get. It's not that the earth is rotating the sun any faster than it used to. It's a matter of perspective. And the same thing can be said of our problems. You know those needles that they stick into your arm when you get your vaccine? the MMR or whatever else the case might be. I was never good at dealing with shots growing up. I mean, I was the kid who kicked and screamed, literally. I was the one that they had to call in backup nurses to help hold down, right? I freely admit this, okay? I admit it, not necessarily proud of it. Even as an adult, I didn't get the vaccines that many people got. You know, like the flu vaccine. Every year, my mom, you need to get the flu vaccine. Yes, ma'am. I know the science behind the flu vaccine. I'll go get the flu vaccine, and then I'm going to go to Metropolis and play the roulette wheel. The shingles vaccine, whatever else. Even as an adult, and, and my criteria wasn't whether or not I believed the science. That's become a new thing, a, a very new thing with the COVID vaccines. Whether we trust the science, believe the science, whatever else the case might be. Uh, the real issue for me was, do I really want to get stuck? Less concerned about what they're actually putting in my body, more concerned about whether or not I'm going to get stuck, right? Well, I got cured of that. And here's how I got cured of that. Well, there are several reasons how I got cured of that. Number one, uh, I have two knee injuries, and you know, it, it hurt. 
And then I had to have allergy testing, and I got stuck about a hundred times at one setting, right? And, and so after all of that, needles just aren't that big of a deal for me anymore, right? And, and so again, it's an issue of perspective. And the point that I'm trying to drive home here is whatever problem somebody else is dealing with, it is a very real problem to them. You and I might not think a thing of it because we have been used as a pincushion or whatever else the case might be. And, and so after we have experienced so much physical pain in life, then the lesser pain of a shot doesn't phase us. For the person that has never once gotten the shot, it phases them. This applies for physical pain, and it also applies to emotional and mental pain as well. And, and so we need to understand, and I learned this at, from those late night conversations with my mom, as she was dealing with real life, honest to God problems, like putting food on the table, and I was dealing with, you know, someone who didn't like the shirt that I wore today, and yet she had time to listen to that. We need to understand that every person that we come into contact with has their own set of circumstances and problems. And while it might seem trivial to us, it's not trivial to them. And the point that I want to make with that story is this. If it concerns you, it's not too small for God. Uh, just like if it concerns you, it's not too small for mom, it's not too small for God. Peter tells us to cast all our care upon him because he cares for you. Now, I know I've done this before, uh, but it's a little exercise that I, I pull out every now and then. You'll remember it as soon as, uh, as I say it. But the word that Peter uses, all, the word all there, okay, all means all. All means all. It doesn't mean some, doesn't mean most, doesn't mean the majority, all means all. And, and so when Peter says that we are to cast all our anxiety on the Lord, what that means is no problem is too small. No problem is too big either. But, but no problem is too small for God's attention. It, it's not too insignificant. It's not too trivial for God. Also, no problem is too big for God either. We can go to the other end of the spectrum. The concern of a Christian mother typifies the concern that God has for His children. And then third this morning, the sacrificial compassion of a Christian mother typifies God's sacrificial heart. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, we read this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, for our sake He became poor, that through His poverty you might become poor rich. Everyone blessed with a godly mother can supply an abundance of illustrations to support this typification of God. In 1 Kings chapter 3 verses 25 and 26 we read a story that come to think of that we haven't talked about in quite a long time here. And the king said divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son, and said, O oh Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. This is the story where Solomon became famed as being extremely wise. One of the reasons that I respect my mother is because she is one of my most trusted advisors. I know that there are children uh, who have parents who think that their child can do no wrong. Have you known parents like that? There is no way that my child can do anything wrong. That was not my mom. Uh, to this day, if I am in the wrong, she has no trouble telling me that I am in the wrong. And there is not a doubt in my mind that she can still whoop me to this day. My, my mother never said it this way. My father did. Uh, because my father wasn't the tallest of individuals. And I had a growth spurt as a teenager. I got taller than him. And I said something about being taller than him once. And he just looked at me and said, 
Son, all that means is that I need to get a bigger stick. Now, Mom never said it that way, but uh, I, I have, just as we are supposed to have godly fear for the Lord, I have godly fear for my mom. I was at Walmart the other day uh, because uh, I, I guess, was in the mood for punishment. But I was at Walmart the other day picking up a few things, and I go to the self-checkout lane, right? And I just had one or two things. And there was a lady who had one of the shopping carts. And we both got there at about the same time. And she had, you know, more items than I did, noticeably more items than I did. And, and I said, you know, ma'am, go ahead. And she said, uh, no, you know, you just have a couple items, you know, you go ahead. And I said, please, ma'am, go ahead. My mom would whip me to this day if she knew that I got in line in front of a lady. I know that's old-fashioned, and I know that one of these days I am probably going to get yelled at for taking that position at Walmart or wherever else. Uh, but the point is, uh, I am fortunate to have a mom who isn't blinded by my imperfections uh, and will tell me that I am wrong when I am. But even when I'm in the wrong, she will encourage me to go in the right direction. And that is another trait of godly parents, of godly mothers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, the Word of God tells us that if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Uh, even if we disappoint, even if we let Him down, God will remain faithful. In Psalm 145, verse 8, we read that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. We see in a mother's compassion a mother's patience. The patience of a mother can be likened to toothpaste in a tube. Have you ever noticed that it's never quite gone? Uh, no matter how much you roll it up, no matter how much you squeeze it, you will even reach the point where you're done dealing with it and you will throw it away. But even when you throw that tube of toothpaste away, if you were to just really take your thumbs and really start pressing against the nozzle, there, there's, there's always a little more there. A mother's patience is never quite gone. The same can be said with the Lord. The Lord is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus. Romans 15, verse 5. I came across this as I was preparing for today's lesson. It was written by an unknown or anonymous author, but it's titled, A Patient Mother. It begins with a verse from Isaiah chapter 26, Thou wilt keep in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And it reads, Patience is required of every mother. Mothers need to have the kind of patience that prevails under pressure. Instead of being patient, we fuss and fret. We nag and scold. We complain and criticize. We become cross and irritable. Sometimes we feel torn apart in the middle of our many daily tasks and the pressures of this world. So we take it out on our husbands and our children. We become impatient. Satan is always ready to take advantage of our self-control and calm spirits. Life is more complicated than ever before. How can we learn to be calm when life is so hurried? or we feel rushed and pushed. One thing that keeps a mother from being as calm as she should be is that she is wearing herself out. She feels her home must be spotless. Some mothers feel they must take part in many activities outside the home. The many decisions she has to make cause her to be weary and frustrated. All day long, it is hurry, hurry, hurry. We also push this on to our children. Hurry and eat. Hurry and dress. Hurry and get your work done. We even have to get in a hurry to go to sleep at night. How can we get our work done without a sense of pressure? How can we keep our tempers calm and keep our words from hurting those around us 
when we are under pressure. We make excuses and say that we are worn out and that we just can't help it. But we can help it and we must make every effort to do so. Of course, we must keep our homes clean and in order, but we must keep our homes so immaculate that our children cannot play in a comfortable, relaxed atmosphere and all they hear all the time is don't do this or that, then the home atmosphere is not right. It's putting the house before the children. The children will not remember whether the house was always in order, but they will remember if mother was kind, cheerful, and patient. Worry will cause us to be irritable and impatient. We must learn to let go, to be still and know that I am God. In the middle of our many duties, it is sometimes difficult to find quiet and rest. We must let the peace of God rule our hearts. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For us to be patient and calm, we must be at peace with ourselves. If we carry sin and guilt on our hearts, it will make us easily irritated and offended. We can never fool our children. We cannot deceive them. They are quick to sense our inner feelings. We need God's help and grace every day and every hour to keep us calm and patient. Let us examine ourselves as mothers and as wives. Are we patient mothers and wives? What kind of fruit do we see in our families? What kind of fruit do they see in us? After all, patience truly is a virtue. A great message for all of us as it relates to patience and some of the symptoms that result in a lack of patience in our lives. So happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there. I echo Paul's sentiment in Philippians 1 verse 3, I thank my God in every remembrance of you. But we not only thank God for our mothers today, we are thankful for God's decision to save us. We are thankful that His patience and His compassion and His love is just like Isaiah said, as a mother's would be. And so this morning, we not only thank moms for what they have been and done in our lives, but we thank God for being the one who shows us His love for us in this manner, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you ever responded to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross for you? Have you ever repented of your sins, confessed Him as the Christ, and had your sins washed away through baptism? Then, if not, then why not make today the day that you make that decision? And if as a Christian you've come to realize that, that your compassion, that your love, that your patience isn't as it should be towards others around you, then we would be happy to pray with you and for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation today, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. Oh, Savior, thou art needing, so the Savior waits for thee.